so I think I might have packed a lot into this talk more than I should have. But I'm going to share with you today a little bit about the status of honeybees and the work our lab is doing in regards to honeybee health. And I haven't overtly made reference to sustainability in my talk, if only because I think we've really now begun to equate bee health with environmental health. There are new canaries in the coal mine. Um, but bees themselves are fascinating creatures, and I myself have been smitten with them since the first time I opened up a honeybee hive and saw a, complete, a microcosm in a box. It was all there, and I'm not the only one. So even Virgil and Aristotle used um, honeybee society and honeybee behaviors as a, as a way to understand human society. And so I think even though we can investigate the biology of honeybee in a very scientific and rigorous way, um, so for example, we've decoded honeybee language. Mm. So they use dance. <laughs> Sorry, a little nervous. So these dance to communicate things like food quality or food source. So we can know that, but it's still pretty magical and pretty awesome to understand that they have dance-offs every time they decide on a new place to live. So they're very cool. Okay, so although I'm going to focus on the honeybee, there's close to 20,000 described species worldwide. And here in BC, we have over 400 native pollinators. And a lot of what I have to say about honeybees can apply to wild bees as well. So they're um, uh, subject to the same environmental and pathogen pressures. Okay, so the honeybee. So here in Canada, we produce 75 million pounds of honey a year. And so in addition to wax and honey, uh, the pollination services that honeybees provide are over $2 billion to Canada alone. And in the US, where almonds, I think you're hearing a lot about uh, California and the drought and the almond orchards, honeybees are used exclusively for almond pollination. So the pollination services that bees afford alone are um, of great value. Um, but we like honeybees, so native pollinators, so other wild bees can do the pollination work. But honeybees, we can put in a box and we can take them wherever we want to put them. So, and the workforce of a honeybee versus a lot of solitary native bees is <coughs> a mix. So at the height of summer, a single colony can house 50,000 bees. Um, so here in BC, we can take these colonies uh, and all over BC, and we use them primarily for cranberry, raspberry, apples, and blueberries. Okay, so in the last five to 10 years, there were some serious dramatic losses in honeybees that really forced us all to think about what was going on in the environment and what was happening with honeybees. And so um, honeybees, just like humans, are subject to bacterial, fungal, and viral infection. And in just like humans, we were using antibiotics to treat these diseases. And once again, just like us, the pathogens that we were treating were we developing um, resistance to the chemicals being used. So in addition to novel pathogens and drug-resistant pathogens, honeybees were also facing increasing chemicals from pesticides and herbicides environment that could impact your immune system. So it kind of created this perfect storm of stresses on the honeybees. Okay, and so then here in Canada, what that meant was that we saw our winter losses, so um, honeybee colony death doubled in the span of five years. So I work in a proteomics lab. So proteomics, so I think proteomics people don't know what that is so much as they hear genomics and they know what genes are. We equate genes with certain traits, so we know, we hear in the news all the time, genes are linked to a certain type of cancer or obesity or some other trait. But <clears throat> a gene has to be transcribed and translated into a protein, which is the working component. So proteomics is a little bit more difficult to study, but it gives us a snapshot of what's truly happening in, in real time. And so, our lab uses that information, so we key in on that information and, and use it to um, use it for our research in two ways. So one, uh, we read for disease-resistant traits. So from the host side of the host pathogen relationship, we look for colonies that have naturally or that are naturally resistant to honeybee traits. And what we're trying to do is. Um, develop an indicator assay for natural disease resistance. So we want to link protein expression to social behaviors that increase disease resistance. 
And so much like a pregnancy test, it tells you yes or no. So instead of peeing on a stick, you can crush a bee on a stick, and it'll tell you if the colony's disease has that disease-resistant trait. So we want to link protein expression to that. And if, uh, in terms of on the pathogen side, we want to identify proteins that are important to the pathogen so that we can go in and turn that gene off that makes those proteins and silence them using molecular techniques. But that comes with a slew of ethical issues um, that I won't even get into. <laughs> but I'll read that. So, and then if we're going to talk about sustainable beekeeping, we should also talk about the beekeeper, right? So there's a huge human component um, to keeping bees and honeybee health. And so what we're really trying to do in our lab is um, provide new tools and alternatives for beekeepers uh, so that they can manage their bees in a more sustainable way. And I'll leave it there so to say thank you and to point out actually uh, specifically Hives for Humanity, which is a local nonprofit group that works with the east side to keep bees and as well holds a number of events around Vancouver. Thank you. <laughs>